Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to this webinar on Rocks Velocity, Transparent and Accurate Depth Conversion. Just a quick uh, introduction on how it will work today. Today we're using this GoToMeeting hosted session. You can open and close your panel using the orange button and also switch between full screen or windowed to get a bit more screen uh, real estate if you wish. At the end of the session, we'll take some time to answer any questions, and you can submit these into the questions dialogue on the, on the GoToMeeting panel. After the end of the session, we will send a link to the recording out to you within 24 hours so you can share it with anyone else who might be interested in what you've seen today. So with that, I'd like to just give you an overview of the agenda. Um, today, it's uh, myself, Bruce, and with my colleague, Gaston. Firstly, I'm going to give you a quick introduction to the ROX Velocity, and then a quick demo of the workflow. I'm then going to pass over to Gaston, who's going to focus on the ROX Velocity 2.0 release, which uh, will cover in a bit more detail the seismic calibration and depth optimization workflow. And as I mentioned, then at the end, we'll take some time to answer any questions that come in. So to set the scene, I would like to discuss a little bit about some of the main challenges of velocity modeling. One of the main challenges we face is creating a model which is consistent with the diverse sources of information uh, about velocities, about time and depth that you want to incorporate into the model. So typically you'll start with your horizons in time and your well tops in depth, and you're already starting to say something about how time relates to, to depth. As you expand that to include uh, check shots and seismic velocities, you're really building up a, a lot of different pieces of information that you want to include. And each of the objects really has its own considerations when you need to check the quality and ensure that it's giving you something um, to contribute to your model and not. Uh, taking away from the, the quality of your model. In addition to that, there's a couple of practical considerations we must make as well. Firstly, uh, the quality control of the check shots. How much can you really trust the so-called hard data? Uh, and you need to be able to, to look into these check shots and make sure they're they are good quality. Thanks to our old friend Anisotropy, we need some careful considerations when we want to include seismic velocities into the model as well. So we need to be able to calibrate between the two to account for these differences we see between the velocities of the seismic and those of the wells. In velocity modeling, you also always get these leftover residuals um, and you want to decide how to do best deal with them. Removing them completely may result in some velocities that are unrealistic, so there's a careful balance of how you treat these residuals and there should be some good options on how to, to deal with those, those leftovers. In addition, in a typical layer cake velocity model, you also have a number of different velocity functions that you may want to explore or apply and the corresponding statistics that go along with them, like the, the fitting and balancing uh, statistical accuracy with the with the ge geological model. And of course, uh, it can be challenging to manage all this data together. So we have different sources of velocity information, picks, surfaces, uh, lots of functions and corresponding statistics. And of course, with all that data comes great responsibility. So I think this image sums up really what it's like to, to do velocity modeling. It's a really a juggling act of uh, a number of different things which also happen to be on fire, which complicates the process. But thankfully, we're here today to introduce the ROX Velocity, which we think can help you with a number of these uh, common challenges that you face with velocity modeling. So what is the ROX Velocity? Well, it's really a workflow for transparent and accurate depth conversion. And it's available as a plugin to Petrel through the standard Segal Marina environment. The plugin really offers a, a transparent workflow for interactively building velocity models based on a layer cake approach. And this interactivity allows you to visualize a lot of the assumptions from the input data, identify and remove bad players or bad data that's 
um, not giving you what you want. In addition, this also allows you to continuously review the results, which give you a much better or a safer approach to velocity modeling to let you do a lot of scenario testing as you go along, applying different functions, dealing with residuals in different ways, and being able to instantly realize how that will affect your, your eventual depth converted surfaces. The tool also provides a comprehensive workflow for seismic calibration. So as I mentioned, we see these differences between seismic and well velocities, and we need to build a way of uh, calibrating between the two for each of the well locations and each of the locations in our, in our model. In addition to doing the simple calibration of seismic, we also offer some smoothing to the seismic, which can enable you to incorporate them in a, an easier way. Finally, the tool offers you an overview of management uh, of the velocity equations and the residuals themselves. So this allows us to interactively QC and edit velocity functions and possibly spend a little bit less time uh, doing this in Excel. And again, this really lets us understand how the inclusion of different data can affect the, the velocity. And eventually, once we're happy with the model, we can also perform a residual optimization to get rid of those leftovers as part of the process. Once you're happy with your model that you've built, of course, you can then depth convert the objects that you want in Petrel. So using the velocity model, we can depth convert seismic interpretations of surfaces, faults, polygons, and points. In addition, you can also output your velocity maps, uh, K maps, V naught maps from your model, depending on the functions you use, uh, and do this at any stage of the modeling process. A final comment before we move into the uh, quick demo, uh, just to mention that this velocity module sits nicely and complements our existing reservoir characterization and rock physics tools that we have available. So with that, I'd then like to jump into a, a quick demo of the, of the rocks velocity. So here I have uh, Petrel uh, open here with my input data and time, and I'm going to open up the rocks velocity by choosing the marina and selecting the rocks velocity. So here I have the first uh, opening tab of the rocks velocity where I'm going to choose the, the input data that I want to, to build my model. So I start with a number of wells, and this list is populated here only by wells that have a active time depth relationship in Petrel. So we pick up the active uh, check shot in Petrel and use it here as the input data. At this stage, we could also choose if we want to include seismic data, either as points or as a cube of stacking velocities. But at this stage, just for a quick overview, I'm going to, I'm going to leave that out and we'll come back to that later as part of Gaston's uh, demo. So the first tab here just gives you an overview of the, the check shots. You can browse around your wells to see uh, what the check shot looks like, and you can also potentially identify any outliers to those. And at this stage, you can even uh, decide to mute those locations uh, and exclude them from the, from the model building process. So once you've done a quick overview of the, the data, you can then move into the surfaces tab where you begin to define the different uh, layers or boundaries of your model. So firstly here, we define our layers of our model by choosing our surfaces, which are in time, and the corresponding well tops, which are in depth. And once we've done that, this then allows us to get a quick overview here of all the corresponding information related to the data at this stage. So this table is a really nice overview of the uh, the well or this surface, the dwelling surface here, and where it comes from the well in measured depth in TVD, then the corresponding two-way time of that pick based on the active check shot, and then you can immediately compare with the two-way time as coming from the interpretation. So already we can start to build up a quick QC of the the picks versus the surfaces and see where we might have any problems with the interpretation that may need to be rectified before we start creating any uh, velocity information. 
So here you have the two-way time difference and also a information on the average velocity for the corresponding pick and two-way time surface location. In that table, we're given an overview of the surfaces, but since we've created now a model of layers, we can also gain access to a similar table, but for now the layers and thicknesses rather than, than depths. So here we have the, all the wells again, and we get the, the layer midpoint depth, the depth thickness, the two-way time thickness of the pick and of the surface, and the difference between the two. And again, the corresponding, this time, interval velocities for those uh, two different objects. And what you can see here, again, we also offer some QC information where we highlight uh, thicknesses that are exceeding 5% and 10% respectively by the yellow and red colors here. <clears throat> so that's more or less all there is to at this stage in building the model. We have defined all our surfaces and we then create the functions and layers here and move on to the process of applying different equations or different velocity functions to the layers. So this brings me to the next tab here, the velocity analysis, where I can start to choose and map out different velocity functions and see the corresponding velocities and residuals. So we can do that here by choosing the interval velocity map for this upper layer. I can also map here the residuals as they stand. And I may decide then to choose a different function type for this upper layer. Let's choose this time linear velocity. And then I can map out the results in terms of the, the V naught and also the K. So this is a really interactive process to help you understand which equation you should use before you select it and define it in terms of V naught and K. Again, we can also do this interactively. I, if I have a sort of bad player here, I can choose to mute him out and the velocities are regridded on the fly depending on inclusion of data here uh, based on the filtering. And I also could add uh, custom control points if I wanted to maybe control better the velocities away from the well. Um, so then we can move to a different location. We can also change the, the V naught and K here in the table, and we can work our way down the layers choosing an appropriate function. So for the next layer, I may want to choose uh, interval velocity. For the next layer, again, it looks like linear would be most appropriate. I could choose a linear velocity with a variable k or in addition with a constant k. In this layer as well, we also see a nice trend here on the bottom right between layer midpoint depth and average uh, interval velocity. And that would allow us to use uh, an additional method for mapping the velocities through this uh, midpoint trend, which again gives you a map of interval velocity based on the, um, the thickness of the layer here. So again, we can map out the residuals and we can compare then instantly which method is going to give us the best results by mapping out our residuals, choosing the functions, changing what we want. And using the kind of statistics table here, we can also quantify that. So we can see the residual as it stands with this function. And if we change the function, we get a, a new updated uh, residual value. So that's pretty much everything there is to this tab. You can interactively map out the velocities as you wish, test different equations, mute data, add new control points, and yeah, do all this interactively while, while working. The next step is to really output the results, which we then move to the final tab here. And really, what can we get as results? We have the possibility to export the new velocity logs for the wells. We can export the individual points for the wells, which could then be gridded using our own uh, method or Krieging, for example, in Petrel. Of course, we can now get our depth converted surfaces uh, and define any additional surfaces that we want to depth convert and also export these, uh, the maps that we, we've shown here in the plots. We can outport, export for each layer the V int, V naught, and K maps, and also the residual maps for each of the layers. The final element to the output is, of course, the velocity model itself. So we can choose if we want interval velocity, average velocity, and define a survey with which to um, export it to. 
And we can also define here a new time range and also a vertical resampling of the velocities when you export the velocity model. So let's take a quick look at the products before I uh, hand over to Gaston. So here we have my exported um, interval average velocity cube in Petrel now. It's a full seismic cube. It can be incorporated in any additional processes. I then also have my um, surfaces and the corresponding V0 and K for those surfaces, and also the average interval velocity for um, this surface as well. So that pretty much completes a very quick run through of the rock's velocity. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Gaston, who's going to show you more in detail the, the upcoming release, the seismic calibration and the optimization workflow. Right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bruce, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for attending this uh, Rocks Velocity 2.0 uh, webinar. As mentioned by Bruce, I'm, I'm going to go and explain some of the uh, deeper uh, features of uh, this uh, new release. Just to remind ourselves, uh, one thing that we added recently and was very much uh, uh, asked for many users is the ability to use a different uh, seismic reference datum. Many of the projects down there are not uh, uh, in the North Sea. Uh, they are somewhere lo located in uh, higher locations uh, onshore. So if you have projects like that with, uh, I don't know, 500 meters or 2,500 feet uh, um, datum, uh, we can handle that. Uh, that was specifically very important for clients uh, in the US and also in the Middle East. So that's in place in this, uh, in this uh, release. Um, I have uh, now a set of uh, stacking velocities that you see here. Those uh, are uh, plotted uh, in uh, this uh, yellowish color. So now you can see right away uh, combined display between uh, the trends of uh, the check shots from the wells and uh, the velocity functions uh, from the seismic. Uh, we, of course, need to deal with the uh, problem of the anisotropy. So, um, and that is done in the, uh, in the next step. So at, at this stage, all you can do is visualize the trends, decide if the data is good enough. If you see, you know, major outliers, then you can uh, mute them out, send them to, uh, to the seat outside and wait, so they don't play the game. Um, that, that you can do interactively. Uh, in, in the next uh, tab is where we deal with the problem of um, defining a strategy to do our uh, um, calibration. So we work on a, a layer by layer uh, approach so you can start and way up and you see these uh, circles here they are uh, a radius in this case of 250 meters which i'm using to collect uh, the seismic locations around the well and then we collect in this case for example it's like a couple of them uh, four or five depending on the radius it's up to you and we build uh, uh, out of that we know the top and the bottom so we can calculate the um, Interval velocity of the seismic. And then uh, also we can uh, estimate the same uh, interval velocity for the well. And this gives us already uh, two values which we can cross plot for each well here. And once we have these values, then we have a correction. We can derive a correction factor for each well location. Uh, that's uh, good for the well locations. So if you, uh, if I reduce my view in the map just to that you can see what's going on I can calculate this value and the original um, seismic velocity locations are in uh, gray and then here I'm approaching now and uh, getting much closer to my velocity uh, from the well and with my seismic velocity but what happens uh, away from uh, uh, from the wells uh, that's a problem if you go out uh, you know 
to the south, there is no wells. And in, in several projects, this problem is, especially in early exploration stages, this is uh, quite a big problem. So there is uh, uh, the possibility where you can go as a user and use the, uh, but uh, Bruce was explaining these control points where you can add uh, anchor or control points. If, if you want, this is like uh, a very uh, important and common practice. You are contouring this yourself. You're not leaving this out to the computer. So uh, this is a very important aspect. So, and again, this is the, the, the approach you're doing. You, you define which strategy to follow in uh, every layer. And it's a, um, an option, uh, several possibilities to change the um, method. Uh, in, in, in the first one, we're generating the factors and using a, an, a standard convergent reader. We could use all, also a velocity regression, for example, uh, if we want to. Uh, and uh, additionally, uh, so this goes by layer. So in which I could change this, for example, to use uh, velocity regression, so which would give me a different type of approach. But whatever you select here, it's updated in the map. And then also you show, it, the system shows you uh, how the calibration is, is uh, uh, performing you know to close to each location so you, you are allowed to immediately uh, QC the process right so again this is this is important this is the philosophy of this tool uh, that you see exactly uh, what you see is what uh, you get right so it's very um, interactive and open to you Additionally, sometimes you may want to do your own reading outside uh, because you trust uh, your own methods uh, that are quite sophisticated using maybe collocated Cochrigan. In that case, uh, you could export these values into a, a point set in Petrel and then you can go and do your own, uh, your own uh, reading. I will come back to that in a second in another aspect of the workflow. In which case you could, uh, you know, use an external uh, calibration map to do the uh, calibration on that specific uh, layer. So once you have done this, you have defined your strategy for uh, calibration, then um, you uh, you're ready to go to the next uh, step. So now in the next uh, uh, step is uh, where the the whole velocity analysis is uh, performed. Now you have all these starting. All over the place with interval velocities, but as it's clearly seen, there's a lot of linear increase of the velocity or a continuous increase of velocity uh, with depth here. So, for that matter, for example, it might be better to um, model this up with a, a linear velocity approach. So, right away, now you see the Vinod map and it's greeting uh, the well velocities together now with the calibrated seismic uh, velocities. So uh, for the next uh, layer, I, I choose the same type of approach, but for this one, which is this thin layer here, I would uh, rather stick with a, uh, like an interval velocity model here. So if I uh, zoom in, in, you can see that's this layer here corresponding all the locations. Now, Inherently, we are getting noise out of the seismic. Uh, the, this uh, high frequent noise is probably not that realistic. Remember, the seismic uh, velocities are coming from processing. They have been converted to pseudo interval velocities using the Dix approximation, and there's lots of uh, assumptions into that. So that noise is, is, is part of that. Uh, you can never get rid of that completely. But in some case, you may want to go and say, OK, I would like to uh, get rid of some of this high frequent noise. And uh, here I will apply like a smoothing filter. So several methods available. So I would, uh, in this case, choose a mean um, with a filter size of 15. So I'm smoothing that uh, interval velocity in that layer at this stage, uh, which brings me to a gentler uh, trend distribution of the velocity. So forgetting the high frequency variations and keeping the main trends of the velocities. Um, so here control of the uh, velocity values. And again, as mentioned, 
all the time you can say maybe this is a, a velocity you know area here that you don't like too much it's too high maybe you know so in in which case you could uh, go and say you know instead of a seven six thousand feet per second I could uh, say maybe this is just uh, 7,400. So as soon as you change that value, then it regrets and uh, ad adjusts that for you. Very important, this is where you as a user uh, control the distribution of velocities outside of wells within uh, a layer. This is something you do with a geologist or yourself, you know the area. And you don't leave this important uh, distribution of velocities just to the gridding package. Um, again, several options here uh, to, to uh, control and do that uh, um, operation. Uh, as mentioned by uh, Bruce, um, continuously you can also have a look at your residuals and see how they are, uh, 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 how they look like. If you hit on any of the wells, uh, then you can see uh, how in, in a, like we are 56 feet apart in this case we are just 23 feet apart in the in the nori level so it's in percentage like a 0 0.5 percentage uh, far from our uh, marker so all this is leading us now to uh, um, the analysis of residuals and that is uh, done in the depth optimization part. Uh, this has changed a lot uh, in this uh, release. Uh, our uh, previous uh, release had a sort of a black box type of uh, approach. And so we got into several talks with our uh, uh, users and uh, this is uh, uh, the solution we came up with. So there's two modes we are supporting here, a so-called uh, simple mode. In which, in this case, you are we are displaying the depth converted uh, surface uh, without any optimization at all. Here you have a display of the residual uh, map, your residuals, and uh, again, uh, let's look at the uh, these spreadsheets. One thing that is very important uh, for you to to take away with this is. Uh, we've uh, heard so much from our clients that they spent uh, hours and hours exporting data, building this type of regressions and information in Excel tables and trying to get up to this information and then, um, you know, trying to load that back into the system. Well, we do that now here, all that, so you don't need to go to Excel anymore. Uh, but if you still want to use Excel, uh, you, of each of these tables, you just uh, highlight them, it's copy and paste, and then you, you can still use, uh, uh, you know, good old Excel. Nothing wrong with that. But, you know, you, you can, and you, we give you all that information and all the ability to um, understand the data right away within this uh, app. So here you have, for example, the residual values of uh, each of these uh, layers. You may want to go and uh, uh, do again a different uh, uh, greeting outside. I will show that to you in a in a second. So this is showing this um, uh, residual map, and basically this map plus this one uh, gives us uh, this um, depth corrected uh, or depth optimized uh, map. In which case we make sure that all the uh, locations with the markers and the wells fit perfectly. So you have a zero um, residual in this case, and th th those were the original uh, uh, residual values for all of these wells. So, uh, uh, so here you can you know, understand exactly what the, uh, which wells and so on, how the information goes in this cross is very useful. And here you have the result of the uh, depth optimized surface. It's all nice. So now uh, uh, we can, um, as I was uh, mentioning, if I go, for example, to this uh, level here, and I would like to change the algorithm, the approach here, uh, and say, maybe I don't like conversion reader for this case. I would like to use a moving average. Uh, so I could change it. But hey, uh, some users say, I really don't uh, like these standard uh, gridders. I would like to use something else more sophisticated. So in this case, I'm, uh, for example, using 
this um, I'm exporting the values uh, like this and creating the points out of the residual data, saving this in my Petrel uh, tree. Here you have the residual points uh, in uh, as, as a point set with all the values. Here are the residual values. And then you go and you do your own mapping. Like in this case, I used uh, uh, any of the options for krigging uh, that are available in the Petrel package. And once I have my map, then uh, I can go and uh, reassign that map from here. So then I would go and select my, uh, my corresponding uh, map here. I apply that. And uh, then uh, you, you can get that. Sorry, I have that the residual map already here. And then it's reading from Petrel and it's applying this. So I am now applying my own strategy here. So if I hit on this, I get the visual uh, representation of the updated color scale to the ranges here. Uh, say my velocity value or my uh, residual values. And here I have my updated values. So I have changed my read accordingly. So this is the simple mode. In the advanced mode, something else is happening. Uh, in this simple mode, uh, there is no changes whatsoever to the velocity field. But you may want to do a uh, minimization uh, by adjusting your velocities, because this uh, later on, as you could save that uh, process in the velocity model as such. So when you go into the advanced mode, uh, the, you're dealing at this point here with the uh, size, with velocities, internal velocities for the layers. So you have here, for example, the in this dwelling nori uh, layer, you have the uh, internal velocity, and then this uh, residual map is showing you the updated or the residual velocities needed to minimize the differences between uh, uh, the original uh, depth converted surface and the optimized one. So you have to make your velocity either faster or uh, slower, so then you, you get to a better match. This is a very uh, smart process, uh, which leads to a different type of, uh, you know, slightly different uh, velocity, but you need also to be careful. Uh, in some cases, in order to achieve that uh, minimal uh, difference, <laughs> you might have created uh, uh, ridiculous geological velocities. So that's why we give you the ability to fence this process. For example, in this case, I would say um, it is uh, not allowed to go below 5,000 feet per second, and it is not allowed for me to go beyond 8,000 feet uh, per second, for example. So then I would do my uh, um, estimation based on these fenced uh, uh, velocity values. You can control all this again, and then the residual is giving you some uh, uh, warnings in yellow in this case, in the case that uh, you are, you know, you have to change your velocity too much in order to achieve a good uh, optimization. So then you're warned. You can go and, and see what is, why it's going on, what's going on. Too much noise in the data. Is this uh, uh, check shot uh, data reliable? Do I have enough points? But, or I say, okay, I'll, I'll keep it like that. It, it's the way it is. I don't uh, know better, uh, but it's fine. But what is important, if you are doing this uh, later on, uh, you need to defend your velocity model uh, in a peer review meeting. You know exactly what you have done. You know where you have changed values. You know what velocities you have used and why. There is no black box result. There is no black box volume that you got where horizons fit very well, but the velocities look crazy. All this is happening on the fly. It's happening for every layer, for every velocity map you create. You have the control. You know what you are uh, doing. So in that said, uh, we go to the outputs, as uh, Bruce explained. And here, there's several options here where you can uh, create uh, results. So here is basically where we build our velocity uh, models, uh, velocity cubes. So you could uh, choose to do, if you are working with seismic and wells together, uh, you could uh, 
get the results, you know, integrated all the velocities together. So all the surfaces and volumes you're going to get are going to be using both. But also sometimes you may just want to output uh, where uh, velocities coming only from the wells or only for the seismic. So this would allow you, for example, to smooth, to um, create a, a calibrated seismic volume only that you could use in other processes. So lots of possibilities here for you to uh, deal with the velocities. So once you've done this, you have created your, uh, your outputs, then um, uh, the next uh, step allows you to do uh, uh, some depth conversion. But before going there, I just wanted to show you some of these uh, results here. So this is a, a, um, a 3D window in depth. So then I, I have created these horizons. And for example, if you go to this uh, uh, Chile uh, level here, you see there is differences uh, between, especially here, we have lots of problems with the uh, velocities that are coming from the well, so we are a bit far away from the markers. And uh, then we display now the optimized uh, uh, result, which has moved this a bit and is now fitting the markers. And for that, of course, we we can uh, we, we see our velocities, how much we have uh, changed and adapted our velocities to get there. And we can justify uh, at any point saying, yes, we had to do this, but it's still within reason. The velocities are okay. I'm not creating any uh, you know, crazy spikes out of the force in this, uh, this match to, to happen. Uh, then uh, other objects that uh, this is new also in this uh, uh, release, you have a new branch here. Uh, so when I go to that branch, I could, uh, for example, choose any of the velocity volumes, the velocity models that we have created, like our average velocity cube. And then here you say, okay, I want to depth convert, for example, uh, faults. I would like to depth convert uh, a 3D volume. I have this 3D volume in time, but also I would like to depth convert uh, polygons. And I may want to depth convert also points that I have. So once I've chosen all these objects, I hit uh, convert here, and this, the process uh, runs. So let me show you, for example, um, the result of this. I have a, a depth converted volume here that I did using our uh, uh, velocity volume that has been created uh, in the system. It's consistent with all the uh, corresponding surfaces, but also, I have um, uh, created my uh, depth converted faults. So these are the time uh, fault interpretation. But uh, so when I hit them, all these faults uh, have been depth converted. So now you have them in place. Uh, then last but not least, I have uh, some uh, uh, polygons. And uh, these polygons, uh, when I display them here, they are in time. But now if I go and uh, I display them here, they have been depth converted by our process and they uh, exist in depth. So this brings us to the possibility to really go from time to depth and to fulfill the complete uh, workflow. That is what is coming out in this uh, Rocks Velocity 2.0 version. And as you have seen, it's a very open, it's a very, um, interactive process, nothing is hidden, there is no black box, and you have the ability to control and uh, drive your velocities at any point, at uh, any stage. Obviously, uh, another option would be uh, to, if you really need to build a velocity model inside the trail that uh, does uh, other type of functionality, which is required, then nothing stops you to create uh, like your own um, velocity model in inside the trail. Now use the simple velocity model tool, and here we declare our uh, average velocity output of rocks velocity, and then you can uh, hit apply, and then the trail will uh, create its uh, internal velocity model if you need that for uh, you know other purposes. Completely integrated into the system.
So with this, um, I'll um, will wrap up uh, this presentation. Also talking about uh, um, where we are now and where we are heading to. So this is uh, we're about to release uh, this uh, Rocks Velocity 2.0 release. Um, an early beta is already being distributed to our selected uh, clients. Uh, thank you all uh, for that, uh, because you help us uh, also finding uh, things and uh, again giving us uh, so much uh, valuable uh, feedback. Uh, we are aiming to release this by October next uh, month. So there is still lots of stuff to do, documentation, help files, and so on. We are working hard and uh, you know, at full speed to get there. To recap, this all this product started 18 months ago. Uh, we had a 1.0 version that uh, first aimed to support existing petrol velocity model building workflows. But then uh, very fast uh, clients started to uh, push us into more and more directions. And so we had to add features like datuming, reading seismic cubes. And now we have a 2.0 about to be released, which offers a complete layer cake depth conversion workflow with a very open and uh, transparent and therefore much more accurate uh, way to, to, to build that inside Petrel. Roadmap, um, you always want to know where we're going. Uh, once this is done, we're thinking about, uh, and we have already the main components and uh, framework in place to do uh, uncertainty analysis, blind well testing, and then, you know, give you volumetric and uh, depth uh, to perturb depth surfaces and do uh, this P10, 50 and 90 realizations. Then uh, there's a much desire from some clients to do multi-survey merging of velocities and uh, to add some additional statistical options for seismic calibration. But all, importantly, please uh, never forget, this is a user-driven software app. We are very fast when it comes to response and uh, in, implement things. Uh, or what you're looking at now is uh, 18 months old, and it's already a version 2 with a full-featured time to depth uh, conversion <clears throat> workflow. I would like to thank you very, very much for attending, and I'll give back now the stage to my friend uh, Bruce.